Hello, my name's Chris Sarmosh. I'm a co-founder of Labour for a Green New Deal, and I'll be introducing this session, which is an exciting collaboration between the World Transformed, Open House, and Labour for a Green New Deal. So Thursday, just gone, was the anniversary of Labour Conference 2019, voting overwhelmingly in favour of the motion for a Green New Deal. One year on, it's clear that we need a socialist Green New Deal more than ever. In that time, serious flooding has hit the UK, Senegal and Bangladesh. California has seen its worst ever wildfires. East Africa has been hit by plagues of locusts. And the COVID-19 pandemic has locked down economies and threatened livelihoods as a major recession and mass unemployment looms. The Green New Deal was a big part of Labour's manifesto for the 2019 general election, which came just after that conference. Although the Green New Deal didn't feature prominently in Labour's national election campaign, one feature of Labour's defeat in that election was, after a decade of austerity, a real difficulty for many voters to buy into um, the ambition of, of Labour's policy. One of the challenges that we face organising and winning a Green New Deal is being able to imagine what that would look like, to believe that it's realistic, that it's possible, and to understand how it would act as a framework to materially improve everyone's lives while addressing climate breakdown. So in this session, we're going to be using the game City Skylines to do just that. YouTuber Justin Roshniak has built an incredible fictional town using the game which we can use to demonstrate the changes to the built landscape that a Green New Deal could bring. Justin hosts, hosts Well There's Your Problem, a podcast about engineering disasters, and produces the YouTube channel Do Not Eat 01, which explores urban design issues and history through the medium of city skylines. If you've not seen them already, check out Justin's YouTube channel, which includes a few streams of building the town from scratch. Our panel of campaigners and experts will, throughout this session, make suggestions of the types of transformations that we could see through a Green New Deal, and then they'll be modelled in the game in real time. I'm joined by Fernanda Balata, who is Senior Programme Manager at the New Economics Foundation and leader of the Blue, the Blue New Deal Initiative. Pearl Ahrens, who's a transport planner, an active member of the London Renters Union and a London cycling campaigner. Adrian Buller, a senior research fellow at Commonwealth, and Selena Truhertz, a national food service activist in Sheffield and nationally. So, the town we're going to be taking a look at today is the fictional Carlingdon by Sea on the northwest coast of England. Carlingdon is a fishing harbour, and that's historically been a really major industry for the town. Along the beachfront is a tram and a strip of hotel buildings accommodating the town's tourist industry. Another major source of employment is the oil refinery close by. The golf course and local football team stadium, they dominate the landscape and they provide much of the town's entertainment as well as employment. Collingdon has large residential areas, although some of the houses have been left empty. There are schools throughout the town as well as other local services and amenities. Uh, and that includes the public transport system. So there's the tram and there's also local bus networks, as well as a national train station that connects Carlington to the national rail system. So this session isn't about prescribing any policy solutions for any particular city, town, community or industry. That's why we've gone with Carlington as a fictitious um, example. But this session is really about creating the space for us all to imagine how the built landscape of our towns, our cities, our communities might change with the investment, with the regulation, economic transformations and democracy of a Green New Deal. And then at the end of the first half of this session, we're going to open it out to hear from you for your contributions, your questions, which our panel will be able to respond to. So. Why could Carlington, you know, like so many towns and cities across the UK and, and around the world, benefit from a Green New Deal? Another way of asking that, what are the major challenges that it's currently facing? In recent years, we've seen flooding devastate homes and businesses in low-lying and coastal areas. 
As sea levels rise and floods become more frequent and severe, Carlingen's infrastructure is under threat. In particular, a lot of that infrastructure on the coast is tied to the tourist industry. As well as that, the extreme heat and cold that we'll see intensify with climate breakdown. Um, that's experienced across the board, but in Carlingdon, the population is disproportionately elderly, and it's that elderly population that is most susceptible to those extremes in temperature. So overheating in the summer months, and then the freezing cold in the winter, which intersects with fuel poverty, leads to excess deaths annually. And then the acidification of seas and oceans that we're seeing with climate change, that will continue to deplete fishing stocks, further compounding the challenges that Carlingdon's fishing industry is already seeing. And then COVID-19 has had a major impact on Carlingdon's tourist industry as well, and the threat of future lockdowns and pandemics will make it even more unstable as a source of income for the town. And then finally, as climate breakdown moves up the national agenda, there's going to be growing political pressure to phase out um, Carlingdon's oil refinery. And that's been a major source of jobs, not just for the workers at the refinery, but also in the services and the local economy, which is uh, often hinged around the site. So we've heard about Carlingdon for now. What's a Green New Deal? What could it mean for a town like Carlingdon? Simply put, the Green New Deal is a government-led program of investment, regulation, and economic transformation, bringing together the dual aims of climate and economic justice. The idea was first developed in the UK in the aftermath of the 2008 financial crisis, but it's more recently been popularised by Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, congressperson in the US, and the Sunrise Movement as well. At its core, the Green New Deal has a recognition that the root causes of climate and economic injustices are the same. At Labour for a Green New Deal, we understand that to be capitalism and the profit motive which currently structures our economy. So by investing in the energy transition, adapting our society to climate breakdown, meeting those basic human needs, bringing the economy into public ownership, and rebuilding working class power, these are the measures that we can use through a Green New Deal to achieve both climate and economic justice. One of the really core elements of all Green New Deals, whatever the interpretation, has been green jobs. So when we think about work, the majority of people in our society, they're reliant on work to survive. But increasingly, they suffer from job insecurity, low pay, poor conditions. And in many towns and cities, there isn't enough employment for the population. That's where we see structural unemployment. So where industries like Carlin's oil refinery still exist, they often provide well-paid, secure, unionised employment. But where, as our energy systems begin to transition, that's going to change. So that rare source of security for workers for a community, that's increasingly going to be under threat. But resisting and adapting to the climate emergency will bring or could bring a raft of new jobs in energy, construction and the wider economy. That's why we need a Green New Deal as a framework to ensure that those new jobs come where jobs um, in industries of the past, like oil, have to transition away. So the Green New Deal is about using a framework of investment and economic democracy to chart a new industrial future for towns like Carlingdon. A Green New Deal shouldn't be, it can't be, just about diktats from central government or Westminster policy wonks, deciding which town should produce what. Introducing economic democracy is about giving workers, communities and towns a say in their future development. They have the best understanding of their town's geography, workers' skills, and what that could all contribute to the Green New Deal. So their best place to inform what the investment of a Green New Deal is put into. As Carlingdon transitions away from the oil industry, a Green New Deal would guarantee training and employment for oil workers with equivalent, if not greater, paying conditions. Carlingdon's location on the northwest coast makes it an ideal location for wind power. An offshore wind farm could power the town, 
while playing a vital role in decarbonizing the whole country's energy sector. It would bring with it jobs building and maintaining the wind turbines, and could even lead to the site of the oil refinery being turned into a factory for producing um, the materials for technology required for the wind turbine. And this is work that could be shared, not just around the country, but around the world. It could be a way for Carlingdon's workers to contribute to the internationalist, the solidaristic mission of the Green New Deal. So just as Cuba's world-leading medical professionals travel the world in solidarity, tending to disaster areas, Carlingdon and other towns' renewables manufacturers could, could take on solidarity missions to share the UK's resources and skills to support the energy transition internationally. But when we think about green jobs, it doesn't have to just focus on energy industry. It's obviously a really important part of any Green New Deal. But we should also understand green jobs expansively to include anything that contributes to the economic mobilization of the Green New Deal and to anything that is low carbon. So Carlingdon will need workers in social care, in education, in healthcare, in emergency services, in retail, the distribution of food and goods, and of course, in public transport. These are all green jobs that contribute to a just society where everybody's basic needs are met. So for towns like Harlingen, vulnerable to physical impacts of climate change, we can also talk about adaptation, socially just adaptation to what is to come. Because even if we stopped all greenhouse gas emissions tomorrow, we would already be locked into a certain amount of warming based on past emissions. And as we know, we're not going to stop greenhouse gas emissions tomorrow. So through those adaptation measures also come green jobs. The rising sea levels and storms caused by climate breakdown will make flood, flood defences along Carlingdon's coast incredibly necessary. Houses, businesses and public buildings and hotels, they will all need to be retrofitted to make them resilient to flooding and insulated to extreme temperatures. This will be an immediate source of jobs for retrained workers who could then also share those skills around the UK and internationally, adapting our society and our economy to climate impact. And to prevent emergency services from being overwhelmed by the pandemics and the natural disasters that are to come, they should be well trained and well funded. That also means plenty of jobs in these public services. Socially just adaptation means robust emergency services, including fire stations with enough staff, to respond to disasters, both in Carlingdon and beyond. It means functioning high capacity hospitals and emergency medical services of the kind we've just not seen during the pandemic due to a decade of austerity stripping away our public services. It means more nurses, it means more doctors, it means more paramedics. And towns like Carlingdon by Sea need well resourced professional coast guards because as that flooding occurs, as those storms occur, Carlingdon's location on the sea is increasingly um, important. It, it provides opportunities, industrial opportunities, but it could also be a threat. And then finally, the insurance industry, which currently battles against making payouts to every major disaster, should be brought into public ownership so that collective insurance can be provided to help rebuild homes, businesses and communities when flooding or fires or storms occur. So for all of those jobs, crucial to a Green New Deal is that those jobs are in the public sector and they're unionised. We can't leave it to the same private companies that have got us in to these deep injustices, these deep crises, to chart our course out of them. So the government should be creating new public companies to provide these green jobs, these manufacturing jobs, and expanding public services. And also, they should be unionised, really crucially. Our economic settlement that has got us into this mess has seen a disproportionate power in the hands of capital, while power for labour, for organised workers, has been stripped away. So part of the Green New Deal, investing in new jobs, needs to be a rebalancing of those class forces. So we, a Green New Deal needs to include repealing all anti-trade union laws and putting power back into the hands of organised workers, because it's with empowered workers that we will drive the Green New Deal forward. 
through our trade unions, we can demand the most radical, necessary investment in economic transformation. We can direct the economic and energy transition from the shop floor. We can make sure that workers are the protagonists, not the victims of the energy transition. So after decades of deindustrialization and concentration of political power in Westminster, the Green New Deal gives us an opportunity to take that power back for our workplaces, for our communities. We can be in charge of the economy. We can reconfigure it to prioritize climate and environmental justice and economic security and prosperity. So now we're going to hear from the other speakers, some of their suggestions for how Carlin and by sea might change with the economic mobilization of a Green New Deal. First, as I said before, we'll hear from Fernanda Balata on the Blue New Deal for coastal towns. We'll hear from Selena Truhertz on food, Pearl Ahrens on public transport, and Adrian Buller on democratic public ownership. Hartlepool is a poor town across the island from Carlington-on-Sea, on the northeast coast of Great Britain. Sasha is a local resident and leader of the Annex Hartlepool, a local community and resource centre located in one of the top 2% most deprived wards in the UK. I want to read his reflections on the unique challenges facing coastal communities now. Sasha says, the last few months or so, have been some of the strangest I've lived through. Facing an invisible virus, which delivered on its potential to wreak havoc in lives up and down the country, has been hard on all of us. The virus has disproportionately harmed our already challenged communities and kept us in our places for weeks on end. However, uncaring as it sounds, COVID-19 has also given us the evidence that proves Given a chance, people want the opportunity to do things in a different way. Anybody who lives by the coast knows the joy of the sea. We weren't surprised when our coastal towns and villages were swamped by visitors the moment travel restrictions were eased. It was entirely expected and in other circumstances, it would be entirely welcomed. But just now, it's a bit hard to get too excited about it. He goes on to say, we know that for many of our coastal towns, unemployment is scandalously high. Issues like low pay, insecure work, a lack of infrastructure, bed and breakfasts becoming houses of multiple occupation, low educational attainment, transient communities with no sense of place. Second homeowners pricing out local people make daily life a struggle, manifesting in some of the highest death rates in the country. We also know that coastal perspectives aren't reflected in policy and investment decisions the way that they should be. As much as the bankers from HSBC don't want it to be true, we are an island, but our coastal voice is fragmented by the nature of geography. We are singular destinations, places to go to, not places to go through. We are all 180 degree communities and we are isolated but we are also 10 million strong. Sasha is not alone in this, in this reflection. The UK coastline is full of wonders, but it's also no stranger to complex challenges. For the past few decades, coastal towns and communities have topped the list of the most vulnerable places in the country to economic and environmental shocks. Much like elsewhere in the UK, many coastal economies have never truly recovered from the loss of traditional industries and jobs over the past decades, and the fact that nothing has replaced them. With an increasingly elderly population, coastal areas also find it hard to retain young people or recruit teachers, as they lack good jobs opportunities and the appropriate physical and digital connectivity. Just in the past decade, three other issues have added to this context. Declining public resources. Yes, austerity hit the coast harder, given many coastal towns above average dependence on public sector jobs. Increased and unsustainable pressures on coastal marine ecosystems, with the state of nature in the UK ranking worse than most countries in the world, and public spending on biodiversity decreasing over the years. 
Finally, coastal communities are the most vulnerable to the impacts as well as the costs of the climate crisis. Climate change is posing particular challenges for many coastal communities, and this will only get worse without rapid global action to cut carbon emissions. Increasingly stormy and extreme weather affects coastal infrastructure, such as local energy supplies, and pose challenges to isolated areas and those with older populations who are reliant on public services such as transport and health. More frequent flooding is likely to bring down house prices, affect tourist attractions, discourage further investment, and have a negative impact on people's well-being, as we've seen in ever more frequent winter floods. Rising sea levels are also forcing many communities to make difficult decisions, such as having to leave their homes as they battle with coastal erosion. This all may sound pretty gloomy. It hasn't all been bad news. The solutions to many of these problems are being imagined and pursued on our coast every day. From sustainable shellfish farming projects in Wales, in the southwest of England, to many coastal areas investing in culture-led regeneration, to a world-leading hub for marine renewable energy in Orkney. But these examples are still far too fragmented to deliver the transformation that is needed. Policies still have not been able to address the scale of power and resources needed to address these complex challenges. Communities alone can't build cross-country railways or raise the level of money needed to restore coastal habitats. Enters COVID-19. It should come as no surprise that many coastal areas are now struggling the most to recover from the unprecedented social and economic emergency that has followed this year's public health crisis. Coastal towns have been identified as the most vulnerable to the economic impact of lockdown measures by a number of reports so far, including the Institute for Fiscal Studies, Center for Towns, Social Investment Businesses, Institute of Employment Studies, and others. But don't worry if you are not aware of all of this. Nearly 15 years after the first parliamentary inquiry, into the challenges facing our coastal towns, they remain today the least understood of Britain's problem areas. The particular challenges of our coast, its people, economies, and nature, remain mostly out of sight, out of mind, out of policy and investment. So, back to Carlington on Sea. This analysis resonates true, especially amongst local fishers. Like so many small-scale fishing fleets across the country, fishers in Carlington have for a while felt that their livelihoods have been under threat. Access to fishing quotas, access to grant and loan funding, and political support have all been in very low supply for inshore fishers for decades. As a result, many inshore fleets, including the one in Carlington, have experienced low profitability and uncertainty about their future. This context of exclusion and an unequal distribution of fishing opportunities within the industry have also led to two main negative environmental outcomes. With less access to fishing quota, inshore fishers exert higher pressure on non-quota fish species, such as shellfish or sea bass, which has led to overfishing. It has also led to the wasteful practice of discarding fish as fishers end up returning over quota catches to the sea, either dead or alive. So Jerry is a third generation fisherman in Carlington. He used to fish with his father and his grandfather before that. A few years ago, Jerry decided it was time for the community to take control of their own seafood supply chains. Their place in the local harbor was at risk as plans to build luxury harborside apartments were underway. With economic decisions locally prioritizing short-term profits, coastal marine activities were not adequately valued. The fishing industry is a relatively small sector of the UK economy. If you measure it in GDP terms, it's only 0.03%. But the significance of the inshore fleet to several coastal communities is much greater. Plans for luxury flats would follow the usual path of being only accessible to people on higher incomes and likely to be second home properties 
driving local residents and generations away from their homes and communities. Jerry reached out for help. 72 fishermen and 30 working vessels formed the Community Interest Company, the Fishers of Carlington, to enable them to buy the land they work on inside the harbor. A community interest company is a business model and legal status which is designed for social enterprises that want to use their profits and assets for the public good. Their project for a fishing key would enable fishers to own and lease their own key in the local harbor, giving them long-term security and a place where they could store and process their own catch, adding value and selling directly to the public. However, they would not be able to compete with property development unless they already had the funding in place to develop the land as a fisher's key. This condition meant their shared vision looked impossible given that access to funding is too often a barrier to community-led plans. Grant applications are usually long and technical, and fishers tend not to bother. They are distrustful of the process and often lack skills and time to pursue it. Jerry was not about to give up. He reached out for help from a charity, and over the period of three years, alongside a growing number of local residents, he led an effort to secure a sustainable future for the local inshore fleet, and with it, a better future for the whole community. They built relationships and engaged in various conversations with the various authorities and public departments. Despite having voted to leave the EU, like most fishers in England, Jerry was delighted to hear that the European Union dedicated fund to support inshore fisheries awarded the project one million pounds and resource a processing unit on the key side. Fishers would now have control of their own fish sales rather than rely on wholesalers and middlemen to provide the food they harvest from the sea. With this first win, local people began to restore their faith in bottom-up economic change and greater trust was built with local authorities and the wider business community in the area. So they went back to their community economic plan to look at the bigger vision they had outlined. The ambition of the project was never to stop at the fishing key. Their aim was to link this working key with the local community and businesses, as well as to enable fishers to become more environmentally sustainable. Working with the local tourism industry, money now circulates in the local economy for longer, as fishers have more control and gain more value from their produce. Local restaurants and hotels prioritize buying from them, and visitors have been enjoying the local flavors as they spread the word to friends and family about their amazing stay at Carlington. The Fishing Key also hosts an educational and skills center that brings expertise into the area to explore circular economy approaches, marine protection and restoration, and blue carbon projects. There is a team dedicated to working with and training young people in those skills. Fishers can now also focus on testing new ways to improve their fishing practices and the health of their fishery. Working with their local inshore fisheries and conservation authority, local fishers have created a no-take zone in Collington's River. This no-take zone prohibits any fishing activity in a particular area, helping to protect the salt marsh, and mudflat environments, which are important nursery area for bass, mullet, herring, and sole. By protecting juvenile fish in these distinct nursery areas, the no-take zone enhances the offshore fish populations, which can then reproduce and contribute to more diverse and sustainable fisheries. Scientists at the local university have just started working with the fishers to trial gear modifications at no cost to fishers. The pilot aims to raise awareness and understanding of the environmental and economic issues associated with ghost fishing of stactic gear, which is a major source of pollution in the ocean, affecting many marine lives. This whole program of work, ongoing now at Carlington on Sea, shows how with the right priority placed by governments on a sustainable environment, local livelihoods, and more resilient places, new, businesses, mo- new business models can thrive. 
This fisheries-led community project has also acted as a catalyst for renewal of the local economy. It has enabled the local authority to put into practice their climate and environmental targets as they work with a more engaged community as partners. A new program to upskill, reskill, and create good, well-paid, unionized jobs in the area has seen the local authority taking ownership of a series of unused spaces and decaying buildings along the seafront and in the center of town. They have invested in refurbishing and repurposing those spaces and buildings, and now Carlington has a gallery to showcase the local fishing history and coastal heritage, which is a well-visited tourist attraction, a community-owned cafe, which has been helping different neighborhoods in town set up community gardens to grow different types of fresh food, an award-winning marine education facility run by a local marine biologist which uses the coast as an educational resource. Local schools are now starting to roll out ocean literacy in their curriculum and delivering lessons in outdoor classrooms, including the local beaches and parks. There are also a series of community facilities hosting, for example, cooking lessons with local chefs to support local restaurants and local diets in transitioning to more seasonal and sustainable local food. Carlington on Sea now labels itself an ocean friendly town, and they have been leading calls to national government to place the ocean and the vast UK coastline at the center of a national Green New Deal to tackle the climate and ecological crisis through a fair transition to an economy that works for people and planet everywhere. One of the charity workers that worked with the fishes and supported the community led efforts in Carlington noted. One of the most rewarding parts of working with communities is the relationships and trust you can build and the friendships that can result from shared ambitions and long-term goals. Despite differences in background, outlook, and politics, at grassroots level, if the change you want to see on the ground is the same, then those differences fall away and you can get on with making that change happen. Also, a local group of youth climate strikers from diverse backgrounds, were inspired by the community efforts and led a successful campaign to secure changes to how the council now thinks of and invests in the local economy. Local councillors across parties in Carlington have unanimously passed Green New Deal and Blue New Deal bills, which will now provide a framework for local investment and development. Now, other speakers will talk more about the Green New Deal, but I want to finish by explaining what the Blue New Deal for the UK is and why it is needed. The Blue New Deal initiative started in 2014, led by the New Economics Foundation. The Blue New Deal offers a joined up vision for the UK coast, one that could balance the social and economic needs of communities with those of our coastal marine environment, ensuring their prosperity for the future. We have one of the most stunning and diverse coastal landscapes of any country in the world and a unique coastal culture and heritage. The UK coast has still unmet potential for solar, wind and marine renewable energy. Many of the natural solutions to the climate emergency, including carbon capture, can be found in the restoration of our coastal marine habitats and biodiversity, which are also a vital source of food for the UK. The proven health and well-being benefits of access to blue space could not be more relevant and important in a post-COVID world. There is no question that our coast seas and our coastal communities are the key to driving the green recovery. The future of the ocean is relevant to all of us, but coastal communities depend on it for jobs, economic activity and well-being. The coastal and marine environment is their unique asset. It is what makes them different and it is an essential part of their history and their identity. In recent years, coastal towns have grabbed headlines with names like poverty on sea or misery by sea. They are tired of this image, but even more so of the lack of a strategic approach and investment to allow them to realize their potential. Coastal communities welcome the fresh and more positive narrative about the challenges they face. So NAF worked over a couple of years to bring that a diverse network of people together from all regions of the UK to explore the barriers for success, to develop ideas, and to propose solutions to turn a shared vision into a reality. 
The Blue New Deal Action Plan, Turning Back to the Sea, is the result of this process. It was launched at the end of 2016. It provides not only guidance for local coastal plans, but also the building blocks for a national coastal industrial strategy, a framework to create and support good green and blue jobs in particular sectors that coastal towns have an advantage on, including seafood, tourism, coastal and intertidal management, and renewable energy. Carlington on Sea, the Blue New Deal vision and approach allowed one section of the community to connect with another, for one industry such as fishing to support another such as tourism and vice versa, and for a collective effort locally to push for local policy changes that now prioritize a healthy environment as well as economic, climate, and social resilience. The importance of how, how we transition is that new relationships, processes, and policies will shape the legacy for young people for generations to come, one that they can build on the ethos of a community that has set its priorities and developed from within, grounded in sustainability, collectivism, and well-being goals. Thank you. My name is Selena Troyhurt. I'm from Sheffield and I'm one of the organisers for the National Food Service. As well as cooking in the Sheffield National Food Service branch, I help to manage the national campaign, working with all of the food justice projects across the country affiliated with the National Food Service, as well as researchers and community groups to help the National Food Service grow as much as possible. The National Food Service is a network of community food justice projects across the country united by four interconnected aims to tackle food insecurity, to reduce food waste, to end social isolation and to address social inequality. This is so obvious and it's a tragedy that it needs to be said at all in a so-called advanced economy in the 21st century. But the fact is it has to be said. Food is a basic human right. Like water, heat and housing, it is a building block of life that no one should have to go without. The thing is, there is enough food for everyone. The problem is the deliberately dysfunctional way that we distribute it. Addressing inequality by tackling food waste is already the focus of the amazing network of food banks up and down the country. So what's so different about the National Food Service? What marks us out is the idea of social eating. We don't just give out the food, Although many of our branches did do a fantastic job delivering thousands of home cooked meals to people's homes up and down the country during lockdown. Social eating, sharing a meal, breaking of bread together, that's what makes us different. For some of our diners, sitting around the table in a National Food Service branch and eating together with us is the only social contact they may get that day. If you live alone or if you are on the streets, Sharing a meal gives you so much more than the, just the basic nutrition of the food that you are eating. Cooking in wholesale quantities is more sustainable and more efficient as well. Cooking for one and throwing half away is ridiculous. Cooking for 40 uses way fewer resources and hugely reduces the risk of waste. Community space is just as important. We live in increasingly isolated cities when more and more of city centres are owned by private companies. So we have an agenda to create new social architecture to enable people to participate in the life of the city. Now more than ever, we need easy, accessible and affordable ways to be able to come together again. We need our communities to be resilient to future adversity. We'll be relegating thousands to loneliness as well as compromising our ability to collectively deal with crises if we don't protect these spaces now. As activists, Many of you will know only too well, but your local community centres are often cold and dilapidated, perhaps in need of a lot more than a lick of paint. Community centres do an amazing job already, organising breakfast and after school clubs for kids and lunch clubs for the elderly. They allow all kinds of groups to use the space to meet and raise money. Local community associations are undervalued because they don't make the headlines. The work they do is low key, at least for those who never go there. Yet they provide food justice organisations with a ready-made and essential infrastructure. We are open to people of all faiths and none. 
Yet what other experience has taught us is that faith groups are as important as community centres and that they are only too pleased to feed people outside their own communities. If you are hungry and cold, you don't mind where that food and warmth comes from. Creating and protecting community space is a huge part of what we do. This is as much about space as it is about food. We're not just building people, we're building communities. With communities like these, which are explicitly politicized and fulfilling basic human needs, we open up political and physical space for all kinds of climate justice and socialist movements, such as the Labour for a Green New Deal campaign and community group ACORN, using our spaces across the country to organise and support. We need to build communities capable of being resilient to future adversity, able to overcome crises like the ones we have just seen. If you want to know what a national food service would look like in practice in a town or city, imagine a social eating space in every community, made by people from all backgrounds, created in common. Places free at the point of entry, use and delivery. Social equality integrated into the very fabric of urban life and with people able to live happily in their city and community. Around the dinner table, barriers are broken down and real change is made. We believe that these spaces should be the, at the heart of every city. Yet that is only the start. When people start to eat together, barriers are broken down, not only between groups, but also within the food system itself. Larger food organisations, such as city-wide national food service branches, would have greater bargaining power when sourcing food. This could allow us to get better deals on local produce. We can even ask farmers to grow what we need in advance, minimising waste to the absolute minimum. We could have community growing spaces and composting facilities at the end of every street, available for everyone. This means we would know exactly what we are eating and where it comes from, because it's right on our doorstep, literally. Community larders in these spaces could also reduce the amount of food wasted each year even more. The National Food Service would work alongside other projects to take food out of the realm of profit, building consent for wider democratic control of the economy desperately needed to decarbonise. Building this community infrastructure on the ground also empowers a network which can co-create and push for wider restructuring of a national food system run for people not profit, which can expand and translate into many sectors such as transport, care and energy. The foundations of a national food service were laid in Sheffield in 2018 through collaboration between the Food Hall Project, the Real Junk Food Project Network and campaigners in Nottingham Super Kitchen Network, together with numerous projects who share a solidarity of cause. The founding initiatives are from northern cities facing significant cuts in welfare services with active communities who want to change this. Rather than waiting for the government to build us a national food service in a paternalistic, top-down way, we're working on the ground now to build one ourselves. At present, we have 15 branches across the country, united by our interconnected aims. This is how the national kitchens were built in this country during World War II, originally being the hard work of working class women and the communities that needed them. This is also how social eating projects are being built worldwide, being part of many religious faiths and important work of anarchists and communists globally. The NHS wasn't built in the top-down form it's got now. It was based on the ground-level work of hundreds of local insurance organisations and charitable services. The National Health Service, based on the Welsh on Bevan, was lucky to have growing up. This is the vision for the National Food Service. If we want a national food service, we have to build these powerful communities around these principles and activities, developing a network of organisations which can leverage enough power to force a government to fund and support them, building overwhelming consensus and support for the arguments around the need for a national food service among the public. That's really tough, though. In the meantime, we see a lot of local authorities passing the work of protecting the vulnerable onto volunteer organisations like ours, whether through a lack of capability and funds or a belief that this is not the responsibility of a council. Sadly, we know that many will simply leave people to starve without us. 
but what we lack for in funding, we can make up for with numbers. By working together nationally, we can organize and grow into something sustainable, regardless of the level of support we are able to leverage from local or national government. We build legitimacy and power within the project to the point where we gain increased government support. Many of us will choose to accept state sponsorship, but I hope many will also remain independent, as is the case in Brazil and Peru, where social eating flourishes. If the state doesn't own us, it can't clothe us like Churchill's government closed the British restaurants back in the day in favour of rationing, which separated us and stopped us organising by tempting us to report on our neighbours with extra sausages. In the modern punitive welfare system of the Tories, we can imagine how food institutions could end up with systems such as mean testing and migration status checks if the power does not lie with the communities and organisations themselves. These spaces are an opportunity for organising for, for even bigger change so that we can collectively work together to make the world we want to see. So that's us, the National Food Service. We don't do solar panels, but we do reduce food waste. We put good food in people's bellies. We make sure that the people know where the next meal is coming from. We also get people talking to each other and at the same time reduce inequality and improve community resilience. In the new Carlingdon by Sea, we'll change how the streets look and feel so that people's journeys, not vehicle journeys, are prioritised within the town. The Green New Deal will reduce greenhouse gas emissions from transport and at the same time build a stronger community in Carlingdon by Sea. Like most other towns in the UK, the purpose of Carlingdon's roads is moving as many vehicles around town as possible as quickly as possible. This goal is incompatible with stopping climate change because road transport emits around 21% of the UK's greenhouse gas emissions and three quarters of that road transport is private cars and taxis. Even electric cars emit pollutants from their brakes and tyres and rely on national grid electricity, which is currently only about 47% renewable. That's why this plan focuses on reducing car travel within Carlingdon by sea and opening up the streets for other activities. People will still be able to move around, but by different modes of transport, like walking, cycling, and using the bus. This process of shifting the town's existing journeys en masse onto different modes of transport is called mode shift. We'll reduce car ownership by providing cars available to rent on the street and reducing free on-street parking. About 65% of households in Carlingdon by sea own one or more cars. Some people might be uncomfortable talking about drastically reducing car ownership and use. But the Green New Deal as a framework for collective action is a great route to having those difficult discussions in a positive way. And usually, once spatial changes are made, people see that doubts are outweighed by all the positive effects. Fewer people are killed and injured on the roads, air pollution and its resultant diseases go down, physical activity rates go up, there'll be more space on our streets for many different activities, not just driving and parking. There are so many positive effects from reducing vehicle dominance in Carlingdon by sea, but what the Green New Deal is going to focus on is how reducing car-dominated streets will help build back the strength of community that's been denied to us for years. Let's have a quick look at Carlingdon's layout. It's a great size for walking and cycling, not too big. It has its town centre next to the sea. There's a wide road running along the promenade and an A road through the middle of the town. There's a train station in the centre, which connects to other towns in the north. Towards the edges of Carlingdon, there are residential neighbourhoods, narrower streets in a kind of wonky grid structure, lots of on-street parking and then countryside beyond that with a few smaller towns connected to Carlingdon with roads. When you look at it from above, actually quite a lot of the space is road. Like other northern towns, Carlingdon by sea has a lower car ownership than average in the UK, but still lots of people are forced into owning a car through the lack of other options. The pavements, where there are any, are quite narrow. There are patchy cycle lanes on the edges of the wider roads, but 
most people don't use them. The theory of change in this Green New Deal is that people choose how to travel based on the infrastructure that's there. Right now, all the roads in Carlingdon are built for cars, which makes it a whole lot easier for residents to drive. However, only a very small minority are not physically able to walk, cycle or get the bus. Most of the time, when people say they need their car, they mean the infrastructure is not there for them to walk or cycle safely and the bus is too slow. That's why the Green New Deal is making spatial changes to the town to reduce the need to own and use a car to get around and to devote more space to lower carbon modes of transport. Let's start with the residential areas, transforming the space outside our houses and in turn reinforcing communal ownership over the streets. Residents in each of the neighbourhoods will work together to redesign their streets starting from the principle that streets can be opened up for people to use and vehicles should behave as guests. Firstly, streets are grouped together in cells or super blocks of maybe four to nine streets, crisscrossing so the edges of the cell roughly match an existing neighbourhood. The super blocks terminology comes from Barcelona, where the residents and municipal socialist local authorities successfully redesigned two sets of nine blocks into low traffic neighbourhoods a few years ago. Secondly, on the boundaries of these super blocks, there are roads with fewer traffic restrictions. This is because larger vehicles like buses still need to get around town and emergency vehicles like ambulances need to get to places quickly. We'll talk more about these boundary streets in a bit. Within the super blocks, the principle of low traffic streets means we do a few things. The speed limit drops dramatically to, say, 10 miles an hour, and we'll put bollards or heavy boxes with plants in at one end of each street, placed in the middle of the road so that vehicles can't drive through. However, bikes and people can go in between them. This means drivers can't use the superblock as a shortcut because you can't easily drive from one end to the other. But, you know, if you live on one of these streets and are trying to drive to your house, then you can. It's low traffic, not no traffic. Low traffic neighbourhoods are designed to put the residents' journeys first, not those of people just driving through. And because they're a format for town planning that puts residents first, residents are deeply involved in the design process. In Barcelona, the residents design streets that resemble town squares or parks. Applying this idea to the Green New Deal in Carlingdon-by-Sea, residents of all ages will lead the design process, and the results could include many more trees, different types of benches and places to sit, planters, bike and scooter storage, better street lighting, climbing frames or table tennis tables, swing sets, and other stuff for playing, like football goals, hopscotch, and pictures painted on the roads. Once the principle of low traffic streets has been agreed on, there's a lot of space for residents' creativity. By placing these objects in the road, rather than on the pavement, the road narrows and vehicles have to slow down. This both enforces the speed limit and encourages a kind of humbleness in drivers' behaviour. So people living in the immediate neighbourhoods and beyond can now use the street for many different activities and they know they have a right to the whole street, both the road and the pavement. Changing the space of the street gives a noticeable change in the atmosphere and when it's been tried before in the UK and abroad, it's changed people's behaviours, contributing to that mode shift I introduced earlier. Low traffic neighbourhoods make driving in residential areas slower and more difficult on purpose. They're intended to discourage driving and car ownership. Normally, private cars are left parked for 95% of the day, and so removing parked cars and replacing them with a variety of different activities is a much more efficient, enjoyable use of street space. And importantly, low traffic neighbourhoods work. When they've been tried in other towns and cities, Traffic has not just gone around on the boundary roads, but people in and around the neighbourhood have made fewer trips by car full stop. Instead, 
They walk and cycle from their houses because it's now the quickest and simplest way to get to a different part of town because their friends are doing it and they're just enjoying the new place they helped create outside their front doors. Now, the street's not just for private modes like driving and, frankly, storing private property. It's for collective activities like playing games, sitting, chatting, having a drink with neighbours. So, through the process of designing, and the resulting street space. Both the means and ends of creating low traffic neighbourhoods are an exercise in community building that reinforces communal ownership over the streets. So as I mentioned earlier, the cells are bordered by wider streets with fewer traffic restrictions. These streets and wider roads in the centre of town would be intended for faster travel, but not in the car dominated way we're familiar with. Instead of the general traffic lanes, we would reallocate that space to bus lanes and separate cycle lanes. Reallocating space on the roads to these two modes of transport is pivotal in shifting journeys away from cars. There'd be guaranteed pavement, wide enough for a double buggy or wheelchair, throughout the town, and electric bikes, tricycles and electric wheelchairs and scooters could also use the network of cycle lanes. How would these main streets look? Well, on the wider streets, we would have two-way bike lanes separate from two-way bus lanes and on different sides of the road from each other, with a wide strip of pavement running in between them. Narrower streets could be bus only two-way and the street a few blocks over would be bike only. There would be general traffic lanes, but perhaps one way and only where space allows. As before, This is intended to make driving possible, but slower and more difficult, in order to encourage mode shift in Carlingdon by sea. While this may be frustrating for people who don't want to change their travel habits, it's better for everyone overall. Aside from the reduced emissions, it's been proven that people on lower traffic streets stop and talk to each other more, instead of being in their own metal box. The result will be increased connections between people, which will bolster the effectiveness of the other elements of the Green New Deal, as people get to know each other and change Carlingdon by sea together. Most of the town centre can be designated low traffic, although allowing goods deliveries in at night when there are fewer people. With traffic suspended on that busy seafront road, people can wander from town down onto the beach and Carlingdon by sea can really be Carlingdon by sea. With street space reclaimed from on-street parking, there's more space for trees and benches to watch the ocean from. Junctions too would be completely redesigned to allocate space and time to the least polluting modes. There would be more frequent crossings with much shorter waiting times for pedestrians. And at all junctions, the movement of cyclists would be timed to separate them from vehicle movements. Most side roads from the low traffic neighbourhoods are now essentially dead end streets where they meet the boundary roads, so junctions there can be wiped out. Instead, the pavement on the main road can just continue straight along. To increase the effectiveness of the Green New Deal, the roads leading out to other towns and villages would be redesigned to resemble the main roads in Carlingdon by Sea, with space reallocated to buses and cycles and lanes for cars only if the existing road is wide enough. In the Netherlands, intercity cycling is commonplace due to high-quality, well-lit cycle lanes in the countryside between towns. They have priority over the main roads they cross, meaning it's the fastest way to commute. And with Carlingdon by Seas nearby towns only a few miles away, this is the perfect distance to travel by bike. Despite there being less emphasis on resident-led design for these main streets, a quality council-run bus network and a town-wide cycle lane network are crucial for asserting community ownership over Carlingdon by sea. Although most children and many adults in Carlingdon and across the country already own bicycles and almost all of them know how to cycle, they don't because of the way the roads are laid out. In 2019, 61% of people in the UK said cycling on the roads was too dangerous due to vehicle traffic. So it isn't surprising that only 2% of journeys in the UK are currently taken by bike. But separated from vehicle traffic, 
cycling is a completely different experience, less terrifying and much more relaxed. When Manchester Council was designing the city's cycle network, their rule of thumb was it must be something a 12-year-old would choose to use. This just means the infrastructure for cycling should feel as safe as possible. A cycle network built for 12-year-olds would actually be used by people of all ages. In Carlingdon-by-Sea, we should adopt a similar standard, so a town-wide network of cycle lanes on every main road with simple signage and separate from traffic. The age thing in Manchester's rule is important though, because streets built for cars always block children and teenagers' access to the town they live in, because they can't drive. Car-oriented town layouts force children and young people to stay at home or rely on their parents for lifts, especially in the evenings, reducing their independence and diminishing their access to each other and the town. Inversely, a traffic-free cycle lane network, alongside better pavement and free buses, will open up the whole town to children and young people who can explore, developing mental maps of their town and connecting with the street around them. In other countries, a majority of children and young people cycling to school is common. The UK is actually unusual in having made streets so hostile to young people's independent journeys. Since, arguably, the Green New Deal town as a project was made possible by children and young people's consciousness of climate change, it should actively assert their right to free movement around their own corner of the world. Buses, too, are a central part of increasing residents' ownership over Carlingdon by sea. Residents without access to a car, Commonly poorer households will probably have noticed that bus tickets are expensive and bus services are unreliable, infrequent, and often stop after 7pm, preventing them from fully participating in the town. It's not a coincidence that the modes of transport mainly used by poor people are underfunded, infantilised and disrespected. It's because streets have literally been designed for private cars, not for collective forms of transport like buses. Roads designed for buses, which we'd have in Carlingdon-by-Sea, would look completely different. They would have bus lanes for the length of the bus route, and the buses would pull into bus stops instead of stopping in the middle of the lane. This would reduce delays, and would extend the timetable into the evenings, exponentially increase the frequency of buses, and expand the number and spread of bus routes, and allow bikes on the buses. The pavements would be wider, to better accommodate bus shelters and benches. On top of all this, it's imperative that there is no cost to the passenger, creating a powerful incentive for mode shift. This is only possible with a council-owned and operated bus company. While there are still greenhouse gas emissions from electric buses, these are outweighed by their efficiency in getting people around town. Unlike an electric car, which replaces one petrol or diesel car, an electric bus can move 75 cars worth of people. With no fares, high frequencies and good wheelchair accessible design, the bus network becomes a central part of the urban right to roam, an assertion of everyone's right and freedom to access the town they live in. The car-focused design of our town is the result of a kind of land grab by the richest citizens. 22% of households in the UK don't own a car, but this is an average figure. Car ownership varies greatly between income brackets. 65% of households in the poorest 10% of the population don't own a car. Among the wealthiest 10% of households, only 7% don't own a car. That's quite a remarkable disparity. In fact, over a quarter of the richest 10% own three or more cars. Not only are the roads built for cars, and only for cars, but the majority of those cars are owned and driven by adults in the top 35% of the income distribution. It's not just rich people who drive, of course, but it's a reflection of their entitlement to public space that they could have taken up so much space driving and parking their private property on every street in Carlingdon for so long. The same argument is often made about golf courses and the use of private rural land. This earth was made a common treasury for everyone to share, and that includes urban space. 
It's not just down to rich people. They had institutional help too. Thanks to decades of traffic modelling, ever-increasing space for cars is baked into local authorities' town planning. Because of the Traffic Management Act, local councils have a legal duty to secure the expeditious movement of traffic. Councils rely on traffic models, which say wider roads, bypasses and longer waiting times for pedestrians at crossings can ease delays. When people say that reducing space for cars causes congestion, they're just repeating the disproven theories of traffic modelling. Anyone familiar with the idea of induced demand can see that these kinds of car-oriented spatial interventions actually lock towns into increasing traffic over time. For the Green New Deal, in order to let low-traffic neighbourhoods, cycle networks and bus lanes go ahead, and this is really important, the council needs to be bolder in resisting the keep traffic moving orders from government. We need institutional will to convince the government and other towns that streets should be for people, not cars. Even though Carlingdon by Sea is fictional, these ideas are realistic. Every intervention I've mentioned is in place somewhere in the world right now. As we shift journeys away from polluting modes onto collective transport, we reassert our right to our town and bolster the other elements of the Green New Deal. When we talk about the Green New Deal, how it might transform our cities and our lives, we often tend to think in a very physical sense. We speak about the insulation in our homes, electrified trains, people in hard hats laying solar panels. But this is just one part of what the vision needs to be. The Green New Deal is about much more than physical infrastructure. It's a project of total economic and institutional reinvention in which we fundamentally reorganize how we work and live, who holds wealth and power in the economy, and who has a say in the shape that decarbonization takes. In the same way that the original New Deal paired ambitious public works programs with the creation of the welfare state and a forceful reining in of the excess power of Wall Street through bold legislative reforms, the Green New Deal must be a project that completely reorganizes our economy and lives. Because it won't be enough to simply green and decarbonize the system that we currently have in place. Our economic model, defined by the rules of neoliberalism and dominated by the logics and imperatives of finance and large corporates, is inherently extractive, unstable, unequal, and destructive. Vast amounts of wealth are increasingly captured by the 1%, whose carbon footprints enormously exceed those of the rest of us. Worldwide, the richest 10% of the population are responsible for half of all lifestyle emissions, while the poorest 50% of the population make up just 3%. Every year, we use more of the Earth's resources than it can regenerate. In our finite world, this escalating private enclosure and concentration of wealth is therefore not just unjust, it's increasingly untenable. What we need is a whole new system, one where we prioritize public affluence and luxury over private wealth and enclosure, and in which we all share in the wealth that we create in common. But how do we get there? And what does it look like? Twice before in living memory, we've transformed how and for whom we organize our economy. Critically, both times it was radical changes in property and ownership that were fundamental to that change. The first shift came in the state ownership of the post-war consensus, defined by the creation of large centralized institutions like the NHS and public railways, and led by public investment. The second deep shift began in the neoliberal revolution under Thatcher, during which the mass privatization of public assets and a shift toward private finance wholly transformed who and which ends the economy served. Changes in ownership and property relations have always been behind major shifts in our economic consensus. So, if the Green New Deal is to transform our economy once again, it must be based in a shift toward a system that's rooted in democratic ownership. The ambition for a democratic economy is simple but systemic. The steady, irreversible replacement of today's unequal and extractive model with institutions that share the wealth we create in common, where deep freedom, solidarity, and capability are a universal inheritance and which respects our environmental limits and social rights. 
So what does this mean for our cities and our communities? There are several ways this shift might manifest, but we'll look at just a few of them. Land and housing, transport, finance, and digital infrastructures. Land is the original monopoly, and its scarcity has given a tiny few an immense amount of wealth and power, driving skyrocketing rents and property values and a resultant housing crisis. Homes and public buildings are also an increasingly important source of emissions in the UK, due to chronic underinvestment in insulation and low-carbon heating and energy alternatives. And the treatment of property as rental assets that has produced this underinvestment has also contributed to some two and a half million people in the UK living in fuel poverty. A step change toward democratic public ownership of land would allow us to stop treating our homes as financial assets and leverage public investment in retrofitting, as well as the construction of new zero carbon council and social housing to provide warm, affordable and carbon neutral homes for all. To do this, innovative ideas like community land trusts could return the value of the land back to the community, who create much of its value in the first place by paying for investment in local schools, roads, and other infrastructures, and remove the incentive for houses to be treated as speculative investments rather than homes. Democratic public ownership of land will also be vital to tackling the climate crisis by enabling land to return to a carbon sink through restoring forests and peatlands and expanding all of our access to nature. In the UK, 92% of all land is not accessible to the public, and half of England is owned by just 1% of the population. The result? Green spaces that should be available to all are restricted to the benefit of a tiny, wealthy few. In place of land that could be rewilded and returned to forest, we have fleets of private golf courses. And in our cities, miles and miles of parking space is dominated by the private car, rather than shared and converted to green or community spaces. We need new models for owning and stewarding land to ensure this ancient asset benefits us all, rather than enriching a tiny few. Transport is another key site for a fundamental shift from private to public democratic ownership in the process of decarbonization. Transport emissions are the largest sectoral contributor to emissions in the UK, and little progress has been made to reduce these in the past decades. Of these emissions, Private vehicle use makes up two-thirds and contributes to thousands of air pollution-related deaths each year. We urgently need to electrify transport, but we can't simply swap our cars for EVs one for one. Not only would this shift happen nowhere near fast enough, but doing so would result in punitive resource extraction from the global south. Extracting a highly finite supply of rare earth minerals, often involving human rights abuses and exploitation, and monopolizing it for use in our private cars. The problem isn't electrifying transport, the problem is the private car. Right now, our towns and cities are dominated by it. A shocking 50 square kilometers of London's public space, some of the most contested land in the world, is taken up by parking, effectively turning public space private. Four out of five journeys in Britain are now made by car, but these are not equally distributed. More than half of low-income households don't have access to a vehicle and wealthier households are making more and longer trips every year. Meanwhile, the privatization of public transport systems in the UK has been a disaster for travellers and for the climate and environment. Outside of metropolitan centres, especially London and the South East, transport is often unworkable for commuters and underinvestment is chronic, leading more and more people to have to rely on their cars. Rail fares have skyrocketed as private shareholders are given billions in dividends rather than that money being reinvested in electrifying our rail and bus fleets. And during the pandemic, we've effectively nationalized the rail franchises, or at least their losses, so that all of us are covering for private companies' costs during a crisis while they get to reap all the profits during the good times. A Green New Deal would use this opportunity to fully return the transport system to public ownership from trains to buses, and from the national to the municipal levels. That way, rather than enriching shareholders and allowing private cars to choke our cities, we could invest in integrated, electrified, accessible, and affordable transport for all, and manage it democratically for the public good. The deregulatory agenda of the 1980s also unleashed the power of finance on our economy at huge cost. Currently, finance is overwhelmingly financing itself, with money cycling through real estate, insurance, and financial assets, rather than being used to invest in our communities and industries, and crucially, in decarbonization. 
Finance has hollowed out the real economy too, with companies returning more and more of their profits to shareholders rather than wages or reinvestment or the green transition. The financial system also continues to drive climate chaos with trillions of dollars lent since the Paris Agreement to fossil fuel projects by the world's largest banks. Even now, in the midst of the pandemic, central bank programs are propping up the value of fossil fuel and carbon intensive assets, keeping us all on an accelerating path toward disaster. We need a financial system that serves a purpose, enabling us to do all the incredible and necessary things that will form a part of decarbonization. Democratic public ownership of financial institutions could fix this. For example, community banks with mandates to serve their local communities and with long-term missions like tackling the climate crisis would enable us all to thrive and help to invest in a just and sustainable future. Through these, communities would be empowered to invest in local enterprise, returning life to high streets that have been hollowed out by large financialized chains. And instead of focusing on mortgages for those using homes as assets, community banks would lend to produce value for the communities in which they're located. And a public national investment bank with a green mission could undertake the long-term projects that will be vital to innovation and decarbonization across the UK projects that currently aren't being delivered by private finance and the private sector. But to build a truly democratic economy, we also need to look beyond what we've done in the past and imagine a 21st century commons. Digital infrastructures are an essential part of this and an increasingly essential part of our everyday lives. COVID-19 has underscored just how vital, reliable and fast access to the internet is. But across the UK and within our communities, there are enormous inequalities in access to this vital infrastructure and a steep digital divide. Just 13% of households in the UK have full fibre connection, and more than half of all of the UK's 650 constituencies have below 5% connectivity. Tragically, less than half of those living on a low income have access to broadband at home, which during the pandemic has produced immense inequalities in access to education and the ability to work from home. Meanwhile, BT has paid out 53 billion in dividends to shareholders since it was privatized, all while investment declines. Now, negotiations have begun to sell BT OpenReach to private equity investors, a move that would be disastrous for the delivery of this vital infrastructure investment. Instead of allowing private equity to asset strip BT, we should take this system into public ownership, which will make building a universal fiber network faster and more affordable than the market can deliver, according to the government's own analysis. Universal access will lift up remote communities, reduce inequalities, create connectivity for those who are isolated or less mobile, and crucially, it can underpin the transition to the dynamic, decentralized, decarbonized energy and transport systems of the future. These are just a handful of the ways that a democratic economy could manifest in the physical infrastructures that we often tend to think about. But ultimately, it should touch everything from energy systems to enterprise. We can replace privatization, financialization, the concentration of wealth and power, the extraction and degradation of our climate and environment with justice, shared affluence, and a system in which we all have a say in how our economy is run. Just as in the past, whether it was public investment and ownership of railways or telephone lines, democratic public ownership can serve as a vital tool for creating a democratic economy in which sustainability, justice and community are built into every part of our lives.